business can do better. So, uh, you know, we've been teeing this up and uh, we've got three fabulous uh, contributors with us today, which I'll introduce in a minute. Uh, so what do we mean by this? Um, you know, a lot of people have different definitions and it's really around those kind of three things around social, environmental and economic returns and how can we bring those together in a meaningful way as businesses. I think one of the best ways to tee this up is uh, I had the pleasure of listening to John McKay, uh, the CEO of Whole Foods uh, at Milk and Global last year and he said two things that I thought were very profound to me anyway was that he absolutely rejects the notion that there's a trade-off between those three. There should never be a trade-off, and that business needs a higher purpose than just financial returns if it is to endure. So I think those were kind of three, two powerful thoughts that he delivered. Uh, and I know not every CEO agrees with that, and I speak to a lot of CEOs, and you know, and we have a spectrum of thinking. Um, just to tee it up a little, you know, we, we kind of drown in what I call alphabet soup in terms. You know, we've gone from CSR to ESG to SDGs to double bottom line, triple bottom lines etc etc and you know frankly for ordinary people that's just a lot of alphabet soup a lot of corporate speak and really doesn't come across an authentic way and a lot of people kind of think of this as compliance and remember it's coming from a group you know it's a big group corporations which aren't very high on the edelman trust index so so i think that's a problem uh, that we have as businesses and business leaders how to overcome that um, you know, when we do talk to CEOs, and I think these three folk here really represent that, that there are people that are passionate, authentic, and are really leading the change. Um, and I think we all have a responsibility to kind of get out and explain things in a much more purposeful way. So, um, so what we're going to do today over the next 40 minutes is try and unpick that world a little bit and uh, uh, talk about this very, very important topic. So first is uh, somebody I met a year ago, uh, Julie, who happens to be a neighbour in Southern California, actually. Uh, so Julie's been an executive uh, in major construction businesses uh, and now is a board member of Anthem, which is a major health insurer in the United States, for those that aren't from here, uh, and also uh, a large family of private equity funds. So you kind of have a, Julie, you have a unique perch from the board. You're very plain spoken. And by the way, you're leaving the next 40 minutes in the hands of a Kiwi, American, Brit and an Australian, just in case you didn't get the accents. So you're very brave. So Julie, do you want to kind of lead us off and sure. how you think about this? So the, um, the title of our presentation is Business Can Do Better. And that's actually a line that I heard Lindsay say at a speech that she gave at INSEAD. And it stayed with me for quite a while. Just as a little bit of background, um, as Peter said, I was a CEO. I ran uh, the US division of a company called Costain. They were heavy engineering and mining and construction in the UK. They built the channel, the English Channel in the uh, Hong Kong airport. And I ran their US construction and home building land development business. And this uh, was true about 25 years ago, and I started um, <coughs> being asked to be on corporate boards, partially because I was a sitting CEO and partially because um, I was female, frankly. Um, I started, <clears throat> that's a whole other subject. Um, not, a, not enough wow. time today, but call me back. Um, and I started observing the CEOs that I was working with, partially because I'd been one, but partially because I was very interested in their leadership styles, their beliefs, and what they understood. And very frankly, and I'll invoke kind of a sense of trust here, I was rather surprised at what I saw to be somewhat limited worldviews. Um, some CEOs who didn't see themselves as part of a bigger system. And keep in mind, this was in the 90s and the 2000s when the single-minded uh, pursuit of profit was being espoused, and we had the accounting scandals, and we had the uh, leverage buyouts, and the uh, problems with junk bonds and so forth. And by the way, there's a great book about that now called uh, The Golden Passport by Duff McDonald. It talks about how we, how we got through that and what, what it's led to. But watching some of these CEOs, what I came to the conclusion of was that in order for business to do better, the CEO themselves had to be better. And to be better, it occurred to me that they needed to have some sort of an epiphany of their own. Something that happened in their life that changed their perspective, that broadened their perspective, that made them understand that they worked in um, maybe a corporation, but that that corporation had a bigger mission and that there were social issues that were involved. And I started to understand how that journey for someone to get there was an uh, intellectual journey, it was a social journey, but it was also an emotional journey. And Lindsay will talk a little bit about 
her company, and one of the things that she does is create an opportunity for CEOs and leaders to have an epiphany. So I started trying to think about what that meant um, in business, and I'll come back to Anthem, and you probably know Anthem because of the Cigna deal that we just didn't get done recently. Um, at Anthem, I joined it when it was WellPoint, and we merged with Anthem, and I started, uh, I remember 20 years ago when it was WellPoint, I remember raising my hand at the board meeting one time, I was the only woman on the board, and saying, you want to explain to me why we don't cover mammograms? And so I've kind of had this provocateur, um, I, I say to young women that you might as well be outspoken at the beginning, because then they'll always just say something like, oh, that's just Julie. And then you, then you can get away with more. <laughs> it's, it's true, it actually works. Um, kind of become known for that. So one of, one of the things that bothered me was the fact that this message that we gave that was so appropriate to give to Wall Street, for example, we had $4 billion of excess capital reserves. That was a great message for that audience, but that for a health insurer translated to Main Street as a no answer. No, you're not covered for that. No, you can't have that. So we had these, this duality of, of messages, and I started thinking about how the board itself had to have its own epiphany, and the CEO had to have an epiphany. We had to understand that we were gonna lose our social license to be in business. But I couldn't get the attention. Profits were up, things were going very well, and I couldn't get people's, I remember saying to the chair of the board at the time, we're gonna lose our entitlement to be in business. And she said, I, I don't see that, I don't understand that. Well, the epiphany that we had as Anthem, and as the insurance industry had, the forcing mechanism was the Affordable Care Act. So for many, many years, we were very profitable. We thought our customers were Ford Motor. We thought that we sold, you know, it was, it was B2B. And all of a sudden, we had to figure out who the end user was. And that was very difficult. So when, when you sign up for insurance on an exchange, you're an individual. And our underwriting had to improve. And we had to understand that we had a much broader mission. I used to say to people that I think in insurance you're covered for everything but what you have. <laughs> and unfortunately, that, that was the case, you know, networks and so forth. So our forcing mechanism, the epiphany that came about was because our business shifted. The CEO needed to leave. We couldn't get the attention. So as we've gone forward, that's, that's kind of the litmus test that I've tried to use in my own life. What is shifting? How, how can we have our own epiphanies? And if we don't have a forcing mechanism that's painful, like the advent of the Affordable Care Act and trying to adapt to that, shouldn't we be um, responsible ourselves to have our own journey and our own epiphany? Julie, thank you very much. That was interesting. And it dovetails nicely into Jake Harriman's talk yesterday where he had a catalytic event, as he calls it. So sometimes they just don't happen naturally, right? right. Lindsay, obviously uh, your organization takes, uh, I guess, executives and leadership teams on emotional journeys so they can have these as a forcing, I guess, mechanism. Do you want to kind of talk to that and what your experience is? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think this whole topic is incredibly exciting and life-giving. And the very language you know, that you referred to earlier, corporate social responsibility, this sense of governance and ESG is so dull, frankly, and so dry. And yet, actually, what we're talking about is what makes work meaningful, what makes life meaningful. So for me, you know, this is not about something you do on the side as an extra. It's about the core of why you're in business. You know, who are we? Why are we here? What do we do? And how do we do it? And so this question, I love some of the presentations from this morning, you know, purpose, meaning. People want that in their working lives. Um, and so one of the things I spend a lot of time thinking about and trying to help business leaders think about is how is the business model evolving? How is capitalism evolving? We've created uh, ways of working, models of working, uh, economies, but these are, these are man-made, as it were. We've, we've, we've created these constructs. And actually, we're at a point in time where um, models that have been of excellent service to, to society and to economies actually are no longer fit for purpose. Um, you know, in a world of seven, eight, nine, ten billion people with the kind of environmental pressures that we have at a time of extraordinary, rapid, accelerating change, that some of the ways of working are, are no longer fit for purpose. And so the focus, which in my experience still remains um, far too dominant because we can measure profit, because we can measure shareholder return, frankly, when the chips are down, that's what everybody turns back to. And yet that model isn't going to get us through the next 
decades. And I think a lot of what we're seeing socially, politically, um, in communities all across the world. I personally spend a lot of my time in all sorts of environments, in, in Africa, Asia, Latin America, but also here in, in the States. You know, three weeks ago I was in West Virginia, um, in some of the poorest counties in America, meeting with communities there, bringing leaders from around the world to meet with those communities to think about mm. what kind of future we're shaping. And so this question of the social purpose, um, the, the sense of responsibility of business, I think is about recognizing that business operates in an interconnected world, thank goodness for that, mm -hmm. um, that businesses are made up of people and that people care about uh, meaning and they care about doing something purposeful. So when you really enter into this conversation about evolving business models and evolving capitalism, in many ways, frankly, it's pretty awkward mm. because there is this daily pressure of delivering quarterly returns. And you know, we know it's very easy to find yourself out of a job if you just take one dip in a quarterly return. So how do we build a bridge to the future whilst also walking across it? Because I think our generation sitting in this room, you know what, we're in the midst of creating what's to come. Um, and that's a, that's a tall task because the, the measurement and the scorecard um, remains, if you like, with the past. And so we're, we're both cr needing to create new models whilst also satisfying uh, the pressures of the day to day. I think one other thing I would say is, you know, as we think about business as having a much bigger interconnected role of sustainable well-being across the planet, some of the presentations, wonderful presentations we heard this morning, the energy, the passion, the excitement from the people on the stage and, and from uh, many of you in the room when we're doing something that feels like it's part of something bigger. It's not very exciting actually to just focus on, on shareholder return. Um, if I think about my own organization, you know, we have a queue of people who want to join and get involved and take a pay cut yeah. you know, for the privilege of doing so. So this question of meaning and purpose and rebalancing and evolving our models without crashing them mm. is, is very present with us. And part of, I think, the excitement and, and sense of abundance around all of that is that it's just tapping into what it is to be human. Uh, you know, we are creatures that care about relationships, we care about joy, we care about making the best of, of the opportunities that we have in front of us, we love beauty, we love nature. These things are very important. and somehow they got pushed out of most of our working environments and most of our corporate language. And so for me, this is really about recognizing what is and joining up the being of life with the doing of life um, and, and helping shape the future of, of work and the future of business such that it's far more holistic. Yeah. Now, Lindsay, thank you. I mean, I think uh, let's not leave our humanity at the front door of our office, right? So I think that's very important. So Mark, uh, you're a chief executive of one of the largest mining companies in the world. Uh, you've just joined the board of Total, one of the largest oil companies in the world. Uh, and we've talked a lot about epiphanies. Uh, I think you've probably had a, several epiphanies, but one in particular. And Do you want to talk about as from your perch as a chief executive and how you see this? Yeah, well, thanks, Peter. Uh, firstly, I should acknowledge Rob and the team for, uh, again, a, a great event. Um, from my point of view, the reason I'm here is because you're not from my world. And therefore, I learned so much more in coming to these types of events. So it's great to be here. Um, the reference to an epiphany that uh, Peter's making is that um, I was offered a role in South Africa back in 2007. And uh, it was to lead a, a mining company called Anglo Gold Ashanti, a South African mining company, but it had operations around the world. Um, and in the conversation around whether I should take the role on, the, uh, in doing my homework and in our conversations, the point came up that at that point we were killing one person every 10 days. And I was thinking about that issue. And the other statistic that was rather scary is that our HIV prevalence was about 34% in the workforce in South Africa. And I was scratching my head thinking, how do you think about those sorts of things in deciding to join a company where they have those characteristics? And one of my friends said, that would be the last place I would go and work. 
for me, it was actually quite an interesting conversation because at that point I said, you know, that would probably be the first place I would like to go and work because in the end when you think about what you do in your work, the opportunity to make a much broader impact on an organisation that touches society in a very real way became quite exciting for me. So I made the decision to go there in 2007 and we had the opportunity, we saw that we had the opportunity to make a real difference and we did. Um, Anglo Gold, and this happened prior to my starting, was the first company in South Africa that provided uh, HIV medication to work workforce and to the families of the workforce. And that was quite a controversial step at the time because most business leaders said, well, think of the cost. Mm -hmm. Whereas Anglo Gold said, no, think of our employees and the social difference that will make. And so for safety, we took the same approach. In terms of the conversations around business can do better and how do you make a difference in the workplace, those are the sorts of issues I think you've got to get your arms around and think about and make real decisions in terms of the difference you make in leading a corporation. And there's that sign above the door, we talk about what we do for society and providing goods and services. Of course we won't have a sustainable business if we're not delivering goods and services that society values. But on a much broader basis, if we're not doing the other things that we can do to make a contribution, and in our case, to local communities, because if I ask someone here, who would like to have a mine in their backyard? Don't put your hands up. Put your hands up. <laughs> it's a very rewarding experience. <laughs> That's a colleague from South Africa. <laughs> um, <laughs> And in the end, my job is to try and convince you and the rest of society that you should all want to have a mining backyard in your backyard because I think we can provide your community with something special, a very different future for everyone in that community. And our job, and when we talk about lifting 1.4 billion people out of poverty, the mining industry is one of those very few industries that brings infrastructure to those areas that don't have infrastructure. We bring skills to areas that don't have skills that can build infrastructure and build communities. <coughs> we have a reach beyond our local environments that helps bring the outside world to those communities and we help bring those communities to those outside worlds. And so the contribution that we can make is about helping develop those communities and achieve with them what they would like to achieve for themselves. And a lot of those conversations around how we can make a difference are absolutely consistent with delivering sustainable, improving returns to our shareholders and making sure that all of those pieces connect. Great. Thanks, Mark. Um, lots of questions here. So I think one, one thing I wanted to start off with was um, you know, a lot of organisations kind of view environmental, social things, and Mark, you touched on it, as just a cost line item rather than an integrated part of their business model. So I was talking to the Chief Sustainability Officer of Unilever, Jeff, uh, Jeff Saperstein, and he said something interesting. He got asked by somebody in our dinner conversation, well, you know, you're being pressured by Wall Street to cut costs, so I guess sustainability is going out the door for you guys. And he goes, no, he said, if I had a sustainability department, it would, but we don't but you're the chief sustainability officer. He goes, no, it's an integrated part of our business model mm -hmm. now. So, so they've kind of progressed. So how, how do you get any thoughts on how you progress organisations to get away from this thinking it's a cost and become an integrated part of their business model? Yeah. Be quick, Julie, do you want to kind of? <laughs> Very slowly, I'm okay. unfortunate. Do we have time, though? <laughs> do we have time to, do we, well, for all this to happen? I'm going to give an example of a, of a uh, yeah. board that I was on. It was a company called Lend Lease. It's based in Sydney, mm. Australia. And because they built in 90 countries across the world, they were subject to a lot of different um, restrictions on their building. They adopted GRI very early on, and they had a sense that um, they were building green, therefore they were sustainable. While I was there, when I first got there, I found out that they'd never had a woman on their board. And I found out that of the 31 senior leaders worldwide, one was a woman, 
and she made one third of the lowest man's salary. I found that to be inconsistent with a sustainable model. So I took this issue of sustainability and I said, we, we absolutely comply with all the regulations all around the world, but we're not setting a very sustainable model in business. And then the more that they, they asked me to go out to a number of different countries to, to create diversity um, cohorts, and my message to them was, that's fine, I'll go and do it, but if I go out and find out the status of things where we, we're building and come back and we don't make any change, then nothing that we're doing really matters. And it puts the credibility of all of our sustainability in. So it was a way of trying, it was the, the thing that mattered to me because of my particular perch and my journey but it was a, a way of broadening this definition of sustainability. How sustainable are you if you're just complying? How, how do you really live that if you espouse those, those values? Are you being sustainable if you are cutting out part of the workforce? And it led to our definition of diversity being all the ways in which we differ, which I think was a, was a very helpful thing. So that's, that's a different take on sustainability, but it's a way of trying to get your values lined up vertically all the way through the organization about everything that you do. Mark, you guys are on a journey, I guess. So, you want to kind of talk about that a little? Yeah, I think I think the key thing that we've learned in our conversations, and we're still learning, is that for sustainability to be credible, and the way we talk about sustainable practices inside the organisation, we talk in three dimensions. We talk technical, mm. social, which is people and the focus on people, and, and we have a a term that we use, we hate using the term people are our most important assets. It's the worst thing you can say. You're comparing people to the building, the floor, the assets. I mean, people aren't assets. They are the business. People are the business, the heart and soul. They don't talk to the buildings. I'm talking to people. They react, they interact. For us, sustainable development is making sure that technical, social, and commercial come together in one package. When we talk externally, the technical is environment, the social is community in its broadest sense, and commercial, we're satisfying shareholders as part of the conversation. The key point for us, sustainability conversations are no different to quality conversations and are no different to cost conversations. It's all the same, it's all the same conversation. And to make it real for people in our business, we're in the real estate business. If we don't have access to the resources, we don't have a business. It's that simple. And if you're not operating in a way that gets you close and supportive and have a true partnership with your local communities, we don't have a business. It's simple as that. Yeah. Lindsay? Yeah. yeah, I mean, what you're talking about is this real tough challenge of how do we integrate long-term thinking with short-term thinking and the incentives most of the incentives are short-term or the, the ones with the highest pressure are short-term and yet we know we know if we just look out why are we talking about foresight that just being short-term is not at all right it's 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 not going to uh, it's going to run us into huge problems so how to manage that tension i i personally have huge empathy for people like yourself, Mark, for, for CEOs, leaders of major corporations in trying to achieve that balance because so many of the pressures are against you. But you know, one of the ways I think about it is this is about a balance between being smart and being wise. And we put a big premium on our societies on being smart. We put, put a big premium on, on all of those measurable, the financial skills, the kind of things that in many ways might get you into business school. And we put less attention on the things that really are all about wisdom, um, you know, and, and wisdom is, is much more uh, climatized to a longer term, bigger perspective. It includes intuition and, and our own sensing of being part of a community and, and of being a, an interconnected part of life. And somehow we've got to bring those things into our corporate environments. We've, we've got to um, bring humanity as it were, um, into what we do. The last thing I'd say is, you know, in the work I do, I take people from all kinds of organizations, not only companies, also nonprofits and government, but I take senior leaders and I take them out into the world in cities, villages, slums, right across the globe. And I show them stuff. We go out and we meet with communities ranging from communities in Africa where villages might be struggling with issues like HIV AIDS or 
struggling with earning a living, agricultural communities, through to factories, through to science labs and kind of the, the leading cutting edge of, of, of life. And what happens when you get out and go and see and meet and engage is you find that the world is full of bright people doing fantastic things. I mean, it's very contrary to what you, you would just sort of observe in the, in the media headlines. So there are tons of good things going on. And, and in my experience, when we get out, meet, engage, like you're all doing here at KIN, um, many things become more possible. And we shift from this sort of scarcity, bolted all down um, mentality into a sense of abundance, including, to, to reference our last speaker, the abundance of human potential. You know, here we are thinking about a world where there's far fewer jobs and we're not even going to use all the people who, are, who we have on our planet. Whereas, in fact, we have this vast abundance of talent and potential and creativity and imagination. So it's about the glass being half full yeah. rather than the glass being half Absolutely. full. Absolutely. We should actually be quite excited, actually, by the opportunity ahead. Mm. So actually, business can do better. Uh, would not be amiss if we didn't talk about United Airlines. So, which is kind of, you know, that's an epiphany. So I guess epiphanies come in three ways, right? You know, we can have the Jay Carryman epiphany, which happens in front of you. Uh, and he called it catalytic, and you know, obviously the emotion he showed, we saw that. Lindsay, you take people on journey, so you kind of force an epiphany through a journey they sign up for, or like the United Airlines CEO, you have the epiphany jammed into your face by social media, which is an increasingly big problem, right? You want to be able to guard against that. You know, he totally mishandled it at the beginning, but he, he wrote a letter, I don't know if many of you read it, but there was a very profound line in it that I want you to react to. So he said, this incident happened because our corporate policies were placed ahead of our shared values. Our procedures got in the way of our employees doing what they know is right. So it's this balance of, you know, and anybody that watches that program, yes, Prime Minister, where there's always these bold visions, but the public service ensures that nothing changes and the process rules, right? Um, so how do you get that balance in companies? Because you've got to have some process, but how do you make sure people still have that individuality and freedom to be able to do what's right and what matches their values without feeling they'd be punished. So, Mark, do you want to kind of, I mean, you're a corporate leader, do you want to react to that? I think in the focus today on trust, that is for me the most significant and important word in any organisation. If you have trust and the things that, that help develop trust in an organisation are absolutely critical. It's about the behaviours you demonstrate. So as a leader, I think the most important thing is that benevolence, knowing that people, knowing that you care about people. We've been through a massive restructuring. We've gone from 162,000 employees to 95,000 employees. And the toughest part of that was sitting there with people that you knew you'd be parting with and having those conversations about why and the context and how you go about that process is actually very important. And in our organisation, I parted with our leader of organisation on the basis that, that his view and my view on how that should be done differed quite markedly. And so I think the organisation going through those tough moments yeah. and the way those things are done is where you either destroy absolutely trust or you build trust. And for me, absolutely critical. It, it, it's all around that work. Okay, so I'll go to Julie and then Lindsay. Julie, do you want to? This is a big one, right? <laughs> yeah, so first of all, I doubt that he wrote that letter. <laughs> yeah, probably not. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's authenticity, right? Yep. That went out. Yeah. Frankly, because as I remember it, he had three uh, times at the bat. He had an opportunity to make comments three times. And I think finally somebody grabbed the card away from him and said, look, we'll, we'll write the letter. So the point to me, though, is about culture. And I think we in the US experienced the same thing with the BP spills mm -hmm. and the, the culture that allowed the um, CEO to say what he did when he came here. And that was that there was no one around either of these people apparently saying to them, you can't really treat this this way. I think the United CEO's attitude first was he, his first statement was he backed up his employees, right? Not necessarily a good instinct. So it, it begs the question for me about how have these people surrounded themselves? Who, who can speak truth to power? Who can say to them, 
this is the way you need to behave. But that comes out of that intrinsic sense that we're talking about, about valuing what matters. And I think that's why the letter had to be written by someone else. Okay. Probably right. As scary as that is, Lindsay. Yeah, I mean, I think the process stuff can just become a huge excuse. Um, you know, we, we're all more visible than we would like to think. Um, if you're a leader of an organization, your people see you, flaws and all. Um, and they, you know, it's, it's not really hidden. So the way in which leaders behave, um, especially when the chips are down, um, the little stories that become legends within organizations, both out with your customers and, and within the organization, you know, this is really what, what shapes it. And, uh, you know, culture, changing culture is a, is a long, hard journey, but it starts with the way that people show up. And, and that's really fundamental. I, I also think the, the process stuff is just suffocating to people. I mean, in my experience, the world and indeed corporations are full of people just dying to do something meaningful, dying to really be able to be who they are. Um, and we know what good looks like. You know, every day we, we all make, make, make small mistakes, but basically we know what good looks like and, and people would much rather um, feel that what they were doing was adding value in the biggest sense of, of the word. So in that sense, we're, we're kind of pushing on an open door, yeah. um, but some of that's got lost. Trust people. So to, I mean, our clock's coming down, so I'll give you each kind of a 30 second opportunity, starting with you, Mark, the last pearls of wisdom. <coughs> Maybe I'll just make one reference, uh, just listening to my colleagues. Um, I've got seven kids, and uh, I learn something new every day. And the one and most important thing that I've learned is they don't listen to anything I say, <laughs> <laughs> but they watch everything I do. Yeah. And I think. Interesting. Leadership and leading an organisation, everything we do as leaders is watched very closely by the organisation. And when we talk about sustainability, that's one thing. But when we see, when they see us putting those things into action and interacting differently with all of our stakeholders, that's when it really does make a difference and you demonstrate how important those issues are for everybody. I think that's pretty profound. Yeah, Lindsay? So. Yeah, I mean, I would say something that I think is implicit in this conversation, but perhaps we haven't yet been explicit about, is that for me, this is about building, growing awareness. It's about being more conscious. It's about being more wide awake. And uh, companies are starting to think more about those facets of, of life. Um, but we need, I think, to pay much more attention to how we mature as human beings, you know, beyond all those childhood uh, um, stages of growth, you know, what does it mean to be a rounded, thoughtful, wise, compassionate person? And what does it mean to bring that into the workplace? Absolutely. And Julie? It's, it's interesting. I, I uh, chair the Board of Trustees at the University of California at Irvine, and just came across a professor in the business school who is studying awe, A-W-E. And what he has found out is that it's a universal um, emotion. And it's something that keeps us all connected. And one experience is all the way he defines it as seeing something bigger than oneself. So you could go to the sequoias, you could go look at the ocean, you can see yourself in a much larger system. And as he goes through this research, he talks about the fact that we don't have much awe in business. It's part of our humanity <clears throat> that we don't, don't bring in. And he looks at it as an organizing mechanism that says, how much more genuine we would be, how much more generous we would be, how much more capacity we would have to see systems and, and be systems thinkers if we just experienced a little bit more awe. And he suggests going out and standing and looking at trees before you make a decision. He's done research where people are more generous when they look at trees than when they look at brick buildings or concrete buildings. So I suggest that awe might be a good thing for all of us. Oh, so I think this has been great. I mean, some of the things we've heard are People are the business, they're not the asset, uh, which combines you know, with the whole issue of trust, trust your people and trust all stakeholders. I think simplicity and you know, allowing our humanity in. I think there's a lot we can learn actually from indigenous people. We do a lot in the mining world with indigenous because they do see themselves as part of something bigger, always. And it's really hard through our Western lenses to kind of relate to that. And I think that's a, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. 
Um, I think this issue around compliance with regulation is a huge issue. I, I firmly believe companies saying, I comply with regulation is simply not enough because regulators take ages to catch up. And society's moving at such a pace that companies really have to step up and actually do what's right and recognise that when they do that, and even if it exceeds regulation, actually it, it flows into their financial returns ultimately. Um, culture is what matters as well, and I think that's important when you're dealing with your people and builds trust. And I think ultimately these kind of epiphanies uh, very important, but I think it's an emotional journey. If you hear about everybody's epiphanies, uh, it's always something emotive that drives that. So um, I'm asking the panel to say that because we have a very special announcement, Mark and I, but I won't ask Julie and Lindsay to leave the stage. But first, please thank everyone here. I think it's been a great conversation. Thank you. People that have been kind of been watching our journey. So in 2011, uh, Mark and I had a conversation actually in the lecture th at the theatre at Clinton Global uh, over in the Allen Centre, and we were talking about the mining industry and how its business model and everything it was doing was unsustainable into the future. That sparked a journey called the Kin Catalyst, the mining company of the future. And it's been a tremendous journey, uh, not made possible, wouldn't be possible without uh, tremendous support from a wide variety of corporations and uh, you know, Mark's organisations, both Anglo Gold and Shanghai Anglo American, and a number of people in this room, and I'll mention those a bit later. Um, and the Development Partner Institute has really been formed to continue the work that was catalyzed by the KIN, uh, incubated by the KIN, and it is now to amplify and broaden that aspect. Um, what you see up there is, um, and part of that amplification is, you'll see Colvia, who's the founding executive director, hand up Colvia at the back there. Uh, we're taking that out at regional basis, so this is Colvia and one of our folk, Kevin Phelan, uh, facilitated a workshop in Limpopo, South Africa. Uh, a couple of months ago with a whole variety of stakeholders from teachers, indigenous people, ANC representatives, government, mining companies, to take the principles of the development partner approach that we've co-created with a number of different stakeholders uh, to specific operations. Uh, it's very important to us, we're very proud of it. Uh, we've raised half of the $4 million that we had set ourselves as a target. So we're very excited and to me it's, it's just kind of a pivot in our journey. So Mark, I mean, you've been with us from the very beginning. Um, and you know, when you started, you were the president of the ICM, which is the Pinnacle <coughs> Mining Organization. You know, why has this been important to you? Why do you continue with this? And because you really stepped out in front of your industry, took a lot of courage, took a lot of arrows in the back in the process. <laughs> more, They're all gone now. More than arrows. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, from from if I take the first conversation around um, the difference the industry can make, we have. A mixed track record, people here have heard me talk about the mining industry driving 45% of the world's economy, all those sorts of things. Put all that aside, put all that stuff aside. People don't feel that we make the contribution and somehow we have to change the dialogue. And as an industry and in many of our industry associations, we talk to each other, we share our frustrations, but at the end of the day, it's a conversation between ourselves. So when Peter and I were talking, the thing that struck me, and when I was in the uh, ICM members, the or as an ICM member, member, and then as the president, in listening to the conversation, the thing that struck me is we had to rebuild the institutions that work around the globe and the way we relate to each other for us to change the dialogue around our industry on a global basis. And we said, what better way to learn from how we could change the way we develop operations with our local communities, not develop to our local communities. Really change the nature of the conversation where we start every conversation in a local community with, what vision do you have for your community the next 20, 30, 50, 100 years and how might we, as a partner, play our role in helping you achieve what you want to achieve? So stop thinking like engineers and start bringing some humanity into the conversations and let's change the nature of those conversations. And with that, we needed something or some institutions or an institution where NGOs, our most harshest critics, could feel safe in sharing their thoughts, their ideas about how we may be able to th do things in a very different way and not feel as though they're sitting across the table from a single industry player 
or an industry representative group that has as its sole objective the specific health as it's defined <laughs> by local players and that industry. And so we felt that this institution was really <coughs> providing a creative space for a di very different dog. Some might say a safe space, yep. but a very creative space for those in the mining industry that want to take this challenge on and for those in the rest of society that believes they have something that they can offer and help us do a very different job. And if I can make one other point. You may, absolutely. Cardinal Turks and we, we thought about how do we make different connections in society and we, we came up with the faith-based groups as being the single largest representative group outside of government, government yourselves, or government sponsored institutions. And in fact, the, the Christian church grouping is actually bigger than China. And if you do Hindus, you do Muslims, you, you, you start to get a sense of the nature of the conversations we're trying to change. We sat with Father, uh, Cardinal Turkson in the Catholic Church and we were talking about how we had disconnected ourselves as an industry from real conversations with real people. And he said, what you often miss is for us, it's about two words, meaningful existence. You throw money at problems, you don't actually solve problems. Start working with people, start listening, and you'll find a different pathway for your industry and for the world at large. Thank you, Mark. So, so the DPI, our mission is uh, actually to just to, essentially to improve social, environmental and economic outcomes for all the stakeholders in resource development, but especially those communities, very important. And Mark talks about the faith dot. Before it became fashionable for CEOs to go to the Vatican, which is probably the last 18 months, we were at the beginning of that. We did this four years ago. Nobody knew about it. It was a great experience for the industry, which is now driving that dollar, but at a personal level, it was pretty profound. And we've done the same with the Church of England. Archbishop Justin Mowry, and that continues. We have another one actually coming up before the end of this year. Uh, also, you'll be uh, happy to know we have our inaugural advisory council meeting on the, this up on Friday afternoon, immediately after Kin Global. And many of the advisory council members are here right now. So everybody that's on the advisory council, if you just hopefully there's a few of them, if you could just stand up and uh, be recognised. So thank you, guys. So we'll be have about 16. Thank you. So people from Indigenous. Uh, Oxfam, uh, mining companies, the Vatican, etc., are going to be here on Friday afternoon, so we're very excited about that. So again, something for Kin to be proud of, and uh, something that will leave a lasting footprint, thumbprint on an industry, I hope. So uh, again, Julie, Lindsay, Mark, thank you very much. So I stay, you, I'll let you guys go. So. This is fabulous. Thank you. Thank you.